Hello, students of European history. It's Mr. Barron, and today we're going to be talking about Johann Gutenberg and the beginning of the printing press and printing in general. Really, um, Gutenberg's invention around 1430, 1440, 1450 or so is uh, key to a number of intellectual developments in European history. You can see the device itself there on the right side of the screen and the man himself on the left side of the screen. The impetus or uh, the reason for the need for a printing press has to do with, I think, the, uh, the beginnings of the Renaissance and the creation of a rebirth of towns and trade, people wanting to be educated in a new way, people becoming educated. And so you had the creation of a literate middle class, which is really quite hungry for books and um, manuscripts or books that were written by hand or copied by hand were simply too expensive. So there is a need for a, um, a, a device that can rapidly copy books, disseminate books, and so on. By creating um, a printing press too, it became possible to educate more people. If you think about, uh, in terms of education, coming up with a, a book on how to spell, for example, or how to write, that would be something that was creating even more customers that, uh, that were hungry for books. Gutenberg himself is a kind of a failed businessman. He uh, apparently borrowed a bunch of money in order to create trinkets for a fair, a kind of um, religious fair that was supposed to happen. He got the date of the religious fair wrong and lost all of his money. He had to pay back his creditors and came up with this other idea, really kind of out of desperation. Sadly for Gutenberg, uh, his idea was stolen and, uh, and he didn't really make very much money out of it. But we do credit him for, for creating this unique device. It's not just the device though. There are a number of technological developments that go beyond just the thing that you just saw uh, into, uh, into the creating printing. One of the things that uh, needed to be done was to create a cheap source to print upon. And so linen rags were used, throwaway linen rags were reused in order to create a kind of paper instead of what was being uh, used in the Middle Ages oftentimes, which was vellum or skins, oftentimes calf skins. You'd have to have a really valuable book like the Bible, for example, if you're going to be writing it on skins. Skins are not cheap. Uh, they're they're uh, pretty expensive, actually. One of the other things that Gutenberg is uh, is coming up with is the thing that you see on the bottom left of the screen, movable type, metal letters that you can place on a, a, a kind of um, a, a kind of device that is going to be pressed into the um, into into the paper. Uh, you can move these around. You can spell different things, and um, and they are all interchangeable. So they all fit into this uh, this printing press device. Those are the uni uniformly sized letters. And also you, all, you, had, you needed something that was going to be the, 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 the ink, um, a, a good source of ink. And an oil-based ink is, uh, is what they are starting to use in order to, uh, to print. So you put all of those things together with the actual printing press and you're able to create multiple copies of things um, over and over and over again. If you think about it, though, that what they would do is they would set up page one of the Bible for example, and, um, and then they would put sheets of paper down and then continually press that same sheet. Let's say they wanted to make 300 copies of the Bible. They would do 300, uh, 300 copies of page one and then switch out the letters and do 300 copies of page two. It's still a pretty time uh, consuming sort of, of project, but in the end, what you have is 300 copies of the Bible. The consequence of, uh, of the printing press and those things that I just mentioned was uh, manifold. One of them is uh, obviously they're creating many more books. Uh, there, there are a whole host of people who are working in the printing trade um, as actual printers or the people who are creating those, um, those movable metal letters or people who are, who are creating the paper or people who are selling the books. Um, there's just a whole capitalist boom that comes as a result of this rapidly expanding printing. All over Europe, you have the uh, establishment of different print shops that are printing all kinds of things, um, books that were already in existence, books that are being written, 
and um, and and making books ever ever more present, I guess, in European society. This allows for the rapid dissemination of ideas. You think about a guy like Castiglione, who's talking about this Renaissance ideal of the ideal courtier. Um, that idea would have spread to just a few people if, if his book had to be just copied by hand. But it gets to be spread to thousands of people who can read and write and who can afford books or who can borrow books from friends because of that. And so something like the Renaissance could widely be, um, widely be spread by by books. This happens right away too with uh, religious ideas and reformations that are coming in the next unit. People like Martin Luther, a guy who is complaining about church corruption, people wouldn't have known Martin Luther's ideas if his 95 theses hadn't been taken to a local print shop and printed and then spread from place to place. Martin Luther might have been snuffed out by the Pope relatively early if only a few people knew about his ideas. But his ideas and other religious reformers, their ideas spread all over the place. This is true, too, for the Catholic Church. When they do a kind of counter-reformation or a Catholic reformation, they want people to follow, you know, their their way of uh, of religious worship. And so they're creating prayer books. Everyone's creating prayer books that tell them how to how to worship in their own unique way. In terms of education, you think about educational texts of various kinds, school books, uh, scientific tracts. Um, it's it's uh, a, a newfangled idea that the earth revolves around the sun instead of the sun revolving around the earth. This happens in the, this idea gets put into a book and it gets spread and people then comment on that book with their own books and, uh, and the scientific revolution occurs. Maps aid in uh, people being excited about going to other places, exploring new places when we talk about uh, explorers and conquistadors and so on. It's maps that excite their attention, even if the maps are really wrong. And those maps could be printed as well in books. The state uh, monarchies are really pretty excited about uh, the printing press because they can create codes of laws and, uh, and, and print multiple copies of them and send to send them to every single city and town throughout the realm. And so everybody is following the same laws. They know exactly what those laws are. This creates, too, a whole host of new lawyers who are interpreting the law and following the law and arguing about the law. The state can also put forward propaganda about the achievements of a king or the qualities of a king, stories about the king and so on, and send them to the far reaches of the realm. The bureaucracy can also, you know, get instructions, printed instructions. You create one set of printed instructions, copy them 300 times and send them to the far uh, reaches of the realm. It's really a, a wonderful invention for the state. Also, philosophically speaking, uh, there is a kind of group consciousness that gets created. How do people know about the Renaissance? They're reading new ideas. They're all reading the same books. They're all reading the same ideas. How do Lutherans, people of, of Martin Luther, become a group together? They're reading the 95 Theses. They're reading um, various kinds of things that Luther wrote. In addition to that, we see a move away from the language of um, of the medieval period and the language of the church. And we see people starting to write and to, to read tracts in the vernacular or their own language. They don't necessarily have to learn Latin. They can learn how to read and write French or English or German. And it's starting to create English people and French people and German people based on their own vernacular or based on the kind of, uh, of language that they speak and now that they can read in their own, uh, in their own languages. Eventually, too, it will lead to vernacular Bibles or Bibles in English and Bibles in French and Bibles in German and so on. Well, that was a very short lecture. I hope that uh, that it was informative and that you uh, understand the importance of uh, of the printing press and to some extent of uh, Gutenberg and Gutenberg's uh, invention for sure. Have a great day.